of Oriental Bearing gifts we traverse so far Field and fountain more than mountain Following on the star Well, good morning and Merry Christmas to you all. I am so glad you're here. You know, we're going to be doing a message today about a group of outsiders who God made insiders. I don't know how much that phrase might resonate with you, but that seems to be my life story. Uh, when, when I was growing up, I was never the athletic kid. You know, the jocks weren't my best friends, and when they lined up at recess and you had to choose teams, I was typically, unless it was kill the man with the ball, I was big enough that they wanted me to kill other people, but <laughs> apart from that, you know, if it's running, sport, athleticism, coordination, you know, those kind of things, I, I was on the outside. I always felt like an outsider. When I was growing up, my mom and dad went to a highly liturgical church. Nothing wrong with those kind of churches. I love those churches now, but Back then, I felt like an outsider because when I came into those churches, everybody in the place seemed to know when you're supposed to sit and stand and say this or say that, but I didn't know those things. 
And so since I didn't know those things, I was always the odd duck out. I was never standing at the right time, sitting at the right time, not knowing what to say, and I, I just felt like an outsider. Well, you know, if there's anything I think that's true about this church is that it welcomes the outsider. It, it, it welcomes those who, who for every other reason, they have not found a place to fit in. They've not found a place. You know, we're, we're the island of misfit toys, if you will. You know, we're the place... We're, we're the place that we didn't find a connection other places. We didn't find a connection other places, but we found a place here because you know what? God's heart is really big, and his love for us is really grand. And he really does have a message that those on the outside have found a place on the inside. And we're going to see that today in a really powerful way in this story I'm calling The Gifts of Christmas. As we get started, though, just bow your heads with me. Let's begin with prayer. Father, I believe sincerely that this is the message for the hour, that this is exactly what we're needing to hear in this room, not because of me, not because of my preparation, but because of your leadership, because of where you led me in my heart, where you, what, how you had me prepare for this. And I pray, God, that you would just use this time that we have now together, that the true message of Christmas might find a home in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. So, you know, it, it's Christmas time. We get, we get a lot of gifts. Sometimes the gifts we get are a little surprising, right? I mean, sometimes you get a gift and you just, quite frankly, you hate it. You, you hate it because it's not you. It, it's completely incongruent with, with your taste, your likes, or your preference. And, and when that gift comes from somebody that you're very connected with, you know, a husband, a wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, a best friend, they give you something that's totally incongruent, all of a sudden you think, do they know me at all? I mean, do, do they really get me? Do they understand me? Well, if you've ever felt that way, you're not alone. According to Dr. Pine, a professor of psychology, bad gifts can be a major indication of a disconnect in the relationship. Listen to her elaborate. She said, the way we think somebody sees us is not necessarily how they see us. That becomes manifest in the gifts that they give us sometimes. That can be a bit of a surprise. Now, Dr. Pine is not the only person to ever make this connection between gift giving and how intimate, how connected we are to other people. So did Dr. Barry Schwartz. Listen to this. He said, gifts are one of the ways in which the pictures others have of us are transmitted. Of course, the gift doesn't just reveal the image the giver has of you. It exposes the character and the thinking of the giver as well. Here's just one more. I think people need to regard gift giving as a communication. The ideal gift communicates appropriate and desired messages about both the giver and the receiver. Now basically what all these people are saying is the same thing. That, that every gift we receive is kind of a, a theory of what that person thinks of us or what they wish we would be. So today, if you will, I want you to imagine that every gift under your Christmas tree is a kind of mini revelation. Uh, that jewelry, the blouse, the scarf, the book, the CD, the exercise bike, I mean, whatever it might be, is an indication of the gift giver's idea of you or what they want you to be. This is why the perfect gift makes us feel very affirmed inside. We think, wow, you get me. You know me. You understand me. You knew I would love this because you know me so well. And that's what separates good gifts from bad ones. Great gifts come from people who know and understand us best. So when someone buys us something that's very close to us, that's in, completely incongruent with who we are, no matter what words we might use to kind of cover up our disappointment, there is something inside that feels discounted, maybe even unloved. So that's my premise today, that the best gifts are those that reflect that the giver knows and understands the receiver. Because it's that principle that lies at the heart of the story we're looking at today. Now before we can get to that core principle, i got to give you a little backstory. I call this first point the players and the tension in the story. So I'm going to tell you the story that's commonly referred to as the, the three wise men. Uh, the technical term for wise man is magi. First, a couple of misconceptions we need to kind of clear up. Most people assume that there were only three wise men. You see this everywhere. You see it on Christmas cards. You see it on lawn decorations. You see it in nativity scenes. In reality, the Bible never mentions the number of wise men. It mentions the number of gifts, which are three. So we don't know that there are three wise men. There may have been only two. 
There may have been three. There may have been dozens, which is actually probably more likely. Ultimately, we don't know. The second misconception is that the wise men visited Jesus while he was in the manger. Again, this is not what the Bible says. In the Gospel of Luke, we're told that the shepherds come and they visit Jesus in the manger. When you get to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew says that the wise men come to visit Jesus in a house, not the manger. So it's not the same location. Secondly, the word that's used to describe Jesus as a child is not the the Greek term for a newborn. It's the Greek term for a toddler. So Jesus is a little older. Now, he's still in Bethlehem for sure. He's in a house, and he's older. So even my title today is a little bit off, The Gifts of Christmas, because this story really doesn't happen at Christmas. But because we associate it with Christmas and because it's about gift giving, that's why I've chosen it today. And I thought it appropriate to kind of spend some time unpacking this story. One other clarification. We don't know if they rode camels. They may have. They may have not. But we're pretty sure they didn't wear bathrobes. So every, you know, Christmas pageant you've ever seen, (laughs) the kids coming in their bathrobe, that's probably wrong. Uh, So who are they? What do we know? Well, the word that's used in the New Testament is actually the word magus or magi. And magus or magi, we pronounce it magi, uh, is a Persian word. So what that means, it tells us where they're from. And where they're from is Persia. Persia is modern-day Iraq or Iran. This is a, a region about 700 miles east of Israel. So when the Bible talks about wise men from the east, it's talking about this region. They came all the way from uh, Iran and Iraq. What what were they? Well, they were astrologers and interpreters of omens. Uh, Our magic comes from the word magi. Uh, Since they were into astrology, it's appropriate to ask, what exactly was the star that they saw? Now, again, we don't know for sure. But the Greek word for star is aster, and it can mean actually a a star in the heavens. It can refer to a bright light in the sky. It can refer to a planet. It's really any kind of heavenly phenomena. So the word is not specific. Over the years, there have been several theories as to what the star was. Some people thought it was Halley's Comet. Unfortunately, we know the time frame for Halley's Comet and how often it passes Earth. Uh, The time closest to the birth of Christ was 11 B.C. Uh, So that's just way too early for the birth of Christ. Uh, another theory people have suggested is a supernova. Supernova, when a, a star explodes, it fills the sky with a brilliant and blinding flash of light. Uh, that's also not really likely given the time frame that this star appeared. The most common explanation is a conjunction of planets. So one version says that in 7 BC, Jupiter, Mars, and Saturn came together in a very rare conjunction. That only occurs once every 125 years. That's possible, but get this. The Adler Planetarium in Chicago, Illinois, does a presentation on the Star of Wonder. And they suggest that it was the conjunction of Jupiter and Venus in 2 BC. And that's probably more realistic. One final suggestion is a supernatural light. In other words, this is a suggestion that it wasn't a star at all. It was a light like the Shekinah glory of God, a special light that God placed in the heavens uh, so that they would be guided. And that's a great possibility as well. The truth is we don't know what the star was. But let me take this mystery a little further. A star alone would not tell the Magi what they needed to know. By their own confession, they have come seeking the king of the Jews. They did not get that information from a star. They couldn't get that information from a star. No star is going to tell them that. So they have to have something besides this phenomenon that's happening in the heavens. They've had to have some exposure to Hebrew scriptures to know that a king, a unique king, a Messiah, was to be born in Israel. They had to be able to put what they were seeing in the heavens together with that kind of information. So here's the real question. How did they know the star, whatever it was, meant anything at all? I mean, just because you see something new in the heavens doesn't mean, hey, there's a, a new king that's been born, right? So how did they know it meant that? Well, I think the best way to explain that is to understand that the wise men, the magi, are a blast from the Hebrew past. If you go into your Old Testament, what you discover is there was a time when Babylon, present-day Persia, all that region, Iraq and Iran, they overran Israel. And there was a king, his name was Nebuchadnezzar. And he took hostages. I mean, many people were carried into captivity. They lived in captivity for some 70 years in Persia. But King Nebuchadnezzar took the best and the brightest of the young people to use them in his administration. 
These pagan kings often surrounded themselves with wise men, astrologers, dream interpreters. Now, don't forget, magi is not only the root of of our word magic, but also the root of the word magistrate. Because, you see, these magi were a part of the administration of King Nebuchadnezzar. So this is a big part. In fact, this is why the the song that was just sung right now, We Three Kings, have you noticed that that's probably the only place you've ever heard the Magi referred to as kings? It's not true that they were kings, but they probably served in a royal administration, which is why they're wealthy, which is why they can afford to do this. But they get that from the, the fact that Magi is the root of magistrate. So when he captures these young people, there are four that stand out. Remember him? Daniel and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. These, these young people really stood out. In fact, so much so, this is what the king said about them. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. So these young people are savvy. They're smart. They're sharp. They stand out. Their wisdom exudes from them. It drips from them. A little while later, Nebuchadnezzar has a disturbing dream. His magi, his wise men, cannot interpret it, but Daniel can. And he's so impressed by what Daniel has said that the king does this. The king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its magi, right? Over all the wise men. Daniel's now in charge. So get this, many years prior... God's people were carried off into captivity into this region where the Magi hail from. While they're there, these young Hebrew boys so distinguish themselves that the king places one of them in authority over this group of pagan mystics. He's in charge. He's their boss. He's over their training and instruction. So what do you think a faithful young Jewish boy would do given that authority over these Magi? I think he taught them the truth, don't you? I think that this makes this whole case of the Magi showing up feel like a case of deja vu. I mean, Daniel is placed in charge of these guys. He's going to give them exposure to the Hebrew Scriptures. And don't forget, while he's in captivity, Daniel himself writes a letter that becomes a book of the Bible, right? The book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, which they surely had because he's living there, in chapter 9, guess what Daniel writes about? The coming Messiah, the king who would rule over Israel. And not only that, he gives them a time frame. From this point, 69 weeks of years will pass and I will be born. And he also tells them that this king is destined to die. That's all in Daniel chapter 9. So Daniel has been placed over these wise men. We know what kind of teaching and character Daniel had. And so as this time frame passes, this wisdom had been deposited among these people for many, many years They see the time frame has passed. They remember what Daniel said. They put two and two together, and they follow that star when they see it. Now, I want you to consider this. This system of astrology is something that's mocked in the Old Testament. It's Matthew's way of saying God is reaching out to the Gentiles. He's using their broken system of truth to lead them to the ultimate source of truth, to the person of truth. That's what he's doing. So here's the single most important thing to remember about this. Matthew puts this early in the gospel for one specific reason. These are outsiders. Everything else about the birth of Jesus so far has been very Jewish in nature. It's all been Jewish people flocking. The shepherds are coming to see him. It's all a Jewish, Jewish story. But Matthew says right up front at the beginning, while while, while Jesus is still yet a very young boy, a toddler, the Gentiles are seeking him too. That God is not owned by one people. That God has a place and wants everyone to find his son. So that's one set of characters we need to understand. Those are the Magi. The second is Herod the Great. Now what I'm about to share with you is a new discovery to me. I didn't realize this until I prepared for this uh, message. It's by historian Paul Meyer. He said this. You may be surprised to hear this, but believe it or not, if you ever ask which is the one figure from the ancient world on whom we have more primary evidence from original sources than anyone else in the world, the answer is not Jesus or St. Paul or Caesar or Caesar Augustus or Julius Caesar, none of these, Alexander the Great, no, no, it is Herod the Great, believe it or not. Why? Because Josephus gives us two whole scrolls on the life of Herod the Great, and that's more primary material than anyone else. So when it comes to history, of all the characters you'll look at in antiquity, 
We know more about Herod than anybody else. So we don't have a mystery about him like we do the Magi. We definitely have some source material here. Uh, Herod came to power uh, about 60 years before Jesus was born. General Pompey captured Jerusalem and Palestine. The Romans installed their own rulers, and they installed Herod and gave him the title King of the Jews. Now, Herod was not Jewish. He was half Jewish. His mother was Jewish. His father was Idumean, so he's not a purebred Jew. Herod the Great is a name he bestowed upon himself. So no ego in this guy, right? He's Herod the Great. He commissioned a ton of building projects in Judea, but most importantly, he rebuilt the temple. In fact, the temple that Herod rebuilt, they say, was greater than Solomon's temple, the first one ever built. It's truly magnificent in every way. This is the temple that Jesus visited. Now, Herod didn't do any of that because he was religious. He's a charlatan. He's a liar. He's a sellout to the Roman Empire. He did it to curry favor with the Jews and to keep his throne. That's why he did it. So if I were to describe Herod, I would use three words, crafty, cruel, and paranoid. In fact, this guy is so paranoid that he executed many people, including his own family, because he suspected them of treason. He executed his own wife, Miriam. She was his favorite of his ten wives. He, he executed her. He executed three of his sons. He executed his brother-in-law, his mother-in-law. He drowned a priest. He killed several uncles and a couple of cousins. In light of all these executions, the Roman emperor Augustus Caesar joked, it's better to be Herod's pig than his son. <laughs> Josephus, who, who, who writes about uh, Herod too, he's a Jewish historian. He called Herod a murderous old man. Now, the ultimate example of this guy's paranoia of his violent oppressiveness, when Herod turned 70, he was very sick. He was terminally ill. And he leaves Jerusalem. He goes down to the garden city of Jericho. That's where he's going to live out the rest of his days. When he leaves, he orders his guard to arrest 70 of Israel's most prominent citizens and throw them in jail based on trumped-up char charges on the caveat that when Herod died, they would all be executed that moment. Not because they were guilty of anything, but because Herod knew he was so hated in all of Israel that when he died, no one would mourn his death, and he wanted to have tears when he died. So people would be crying for other people, but there would be tears when he died. That's the sort of man we're dealing with. So with that backdrop, we can understand now the saga as it unfolds. So here we have Matthew 2, 1 to 3. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw its star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. Herod's reaction is very telling. The Bible says he's disturbed. It means to shake violently. Literally, in the words of Elvis, he's all shook up. I mean, he is I mean, this, this, is, this is broadsided him. It's broadsided him because... Number one, he hears a baby's been born king of the Jews. That's his title. Who is this rival that's been born in my territory? And you know what disturbs him even more? How come outsiders know this and my own people haven't informed me of this? These are people who by their own confession have traveled some 700 miles to find this king. There's some kind of sign in the heavens that indicated that, and now they want to know where he is. It's all new news to Herod. He does not get this. He does not understand it. Why is it that these people know this stuff and my own people haven't informed me on this? So he's completely caught off guard. He knows where he can get his answers, though. He rounds up the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Here's what the Bible says happened next. When he called together all, the people's, all of the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Notice, no hesitation. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star appeared. Have you ever watched uh, cold cases on television about like unsolved murders and stuff like that? I, I saw something interesting the other day. A detective was being interviewed and he said, if somebody asks a lot of questions, a lot of detailed questions about a murder, they quickly become a prime suspect. Why? Because you see, people who are guilty are paranoid of getting caught. So they want to find out what other people know. 
In other words, it, it, it's, a, it's this big smoke screen. They, they want to feign being concerned, and their over-curiosity is a dead giveaway. Something else is going on. Well, in the same way, Herod's asking a whole lot of questions, but it's not out of curiosity. Something else is going on. He's worried about his throne. He's worried about this rival. So Herod turns to the scribes for advice, and they say immediately, without hesitation, well, the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. Everybody knew this. Kids under six in Sabbath school are taught this. It's surprising that Herod doesn't know it. The prophet Micah had said some 700 years prior that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Now think about this for a minute. The scribes also have the book of Daniel, just like these pagans did. They know the last bit of information, the specific city where the Messiah was to be born. All the indicators are right there in front of them. But these magi, these pagan mystics, are savvy enough to figure it out with what little knowledge they had. It's a real indictment on the people of Jesus' day, the Jewish people of Jesus' day, that they didn't put that together, that they didn't get that. At this point, now Herod does something strange. He calls the magi and he asks them where the star appeared. The question is an attempt to determine the child's age. Herod assumes that when that star or whatever it was in the heavens first appeared, that that's when the child was born. Now, Herod's only feigning curiosity. He's trying to do a process of elimination, find out, narrow his search. And once he discovers that the child is under the age of two, he knows what he has to do. He's going to kill all the kids in Bethlehem that are under the age of two just to make sure he gets that king. Now, that's scary, isn't it? I mean, this guy is super paranoid. But what he does, he never lets on that that's his plan. He sends off the wise men with his blessing. This is what he says. Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I, might, so that I may go and worship him. Now, these guys are from out of town. They don't know Herod. And everything that Herod has said to them looks genuine and sincere, doesn't it? It looks like he really wants to know who this child is so he can worship too because God is obviously setting this up. And the, and the Magi would have returned to Herod, except God said, listen, don't you go back. He warns them in a dream. Don't go back and tell this man what's happening. And so by the time Herod figures out that the wise men are not returning to give him the location, he sends his edict in to kill all these kids. But the Holy Family has fled. Mary, Joseph, the baby Jesus, they have fled into Egypt for their lives. So here in the rest of the story, the Bible says this. I want to continue with the story of the wise men. It says, after they'd heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they'd seen when it arose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed on coming to the house. They're filled with joy. They're filled with happiness on knowing here's the location. This is the place where the child is. Now, again, I want to remind you, they've come to a house. The Bible says that. The word when it says they see the child, that's the word for a toddler. So it continues. It says, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So once they arrive, they fall on their face and they worship the child. Sometimes we're so caught up in the telling of this story that we go immediately to the gifts without seeing what came first. Before they opened their gifts, they opened their hearts. And that's always the order. Before we ever open our gifts, we open our hearts. Before we ever open our wallet, we open our heart. You know, Jesus taught us, the adult Jesus taught us, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your treasure and your heart live in tandem with one another. When you open your heart, you open your treasures. When your heart remains closed, your, your treasures remain closed. When I open my heart to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, when I surrender my life to him, I give. And when I haven't done that, the only worthy recipient I can think of is myself. So it's always important to remember that our hearts are the first that open. So when they see the toddler Jesus, do you think they were at all disappointed? I mean, he doesn't look like a king. He's not living in a castle, has no scepter in his hand. The kid's probably, you know, kind of waddling like a toddler does, doesn't talk really well yet. There's nothing about him or especially his circumstances to make you think he was a king. To the outward eyes, he's nothing but a peasant child born in abject poverty. But to the magi, he is a king. He possesses more royalty in his cradle than Herod possessed in his palace. He's greater in his infancy than Herod was in his ascendancy. 
somehow the Magi are able to see with the eyes of faith a child who would one day rule the world. And they were not ashamed to fall on their faces before him and worship. So with all of that backdrop, let's unpack the gifts. The gifts and their message. First, we have three of them. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. First, and most obviously, these gifts have a very practical application, and that is they're valuable. They're worth a lot of money. And that's really important because what Mary and Joseph are going to do next is flee for their lives. And they have to go to Egypt because if they don't go to Egypt, they will die. They will be among those numbered in, in, in Bethlehem that are rounded up by Herod and slaughtered. They have to flee. Je- Jesus is a refugee. This is an important part of his story, and we have to remember this, friends. If it weren't for these gifts, I mean, you think about the average refugee. You think about the refugee fleeing Syria right now, this war-torn country, people fleeing for their lives, leaving everything that they don't want to leave. I mean, they don't want to leave. They don't want to, nobody wants to lock their home for the last time and leave and think, I may never come back. Nobody wants to leave. They want to stay, but they can't stay. The circumstances forbid them from staying. And when they leave, they leave with what they can carry on their back. Jesus understands this plight. If it weren't for these three wise men, you think about this relocation, having to live in a place where you're completely divorced from your entire support system, from, from all those people who supported you in your life, you have to be able to survive. This, these gifts gave them the ability to survive in a foreign world until it was safe to return after Herod's death. Jesus so enters into the story of the refugee that he tells us in Matthew 25, I was a stranger and you took me in. That we, as a church, we as God's people, we have to have a heart for those who are fleeing desperate circumstances. So the gifts have a very practical purpose, but there's a rich symbolism in these gifts as well. Remember how we started. I told you the best gifts come from people who know and understand us the most, right? When people really get you, when they understand you, they give you a gift that's appropriate. Well, these gifts reflect the understanding of the Magi. What did they understand about this baby Jesus? Why these particular gifts? Well, the first one is gold, and that's for his majesty. Gold in Scripture is often associated with kings. Notice this from William Barclay. He said, Seneca, the Roman philosopher, tells us that in Parthia it was custom that no one would ever approach a king without a gift. And gold, the king of metals, is the fit gift for a king of men. When the queen of Sheba, which is modern-day Ethiopia, she came to visit Solomon in the Old Testament, she brought 120 talents of gold. You know what a talent is worth? Maybe more importantly, do you know how much a talent weighed? 75 pounds. She brought 75 pounds of gold or 75 talents of gold. Sorry. (laughs) Talent weighs 75 pounds. Times 120, that's 9,000 pounds of gold. Gold's worth $15,000 a pound. You do the math. King David amassed a huge fortune of gold, as did his son Solomon. So Jesus is the king of the universe. And the Magi clearly understand this is the king of the Jews. This is the, the gift that's appropriate for the king. Now, we don't know how much they brought. We don't know the exact amount. But obviously, he lives in poverty at some point, And so he, they, they, they no longer have that money by the time he's an adult. But they bring this gold. Second, frankincense for the high priest. Frankincense is what we call just incense today. We don't call it frankincense. It's incense. Uh, it's made from the resin of the Boswellian tree. It grows in Yemen and Oman. So it's not native to Israel. For a 1,000 years, it's been traded in in markets. It's very valuable. It's known for its uh, aromatherapeutic qualities, its essential oils. It's used to relieve stress, to improve respiratory problems, for minimizing scars. Researchers have found that, that incense, this frankincense, is wonderful as an antiseptic, as an antifungal, and it has anti inflammatory properties to it. But the most popular use in scripture for incense was burning it by the priest. And so you have a kind of a twofold meaning here. You you have the the Magi understanding that this incense is such a part of their healing craft in those days, a natural remedy that they they possessed, that they understand he's a healer, but they also understand this high priestly function that he has. In the book of Revelation, incense that burns is representative of the prayer of God's people as they pour out their heart to God. But for me, the most interesting and shocking gift is the last one, which is myrrh. It's for one who's to die. You can buy myrrh on eBay. Did you know that? You can buy it. It's $2.99 plus shipping. I looked it up. (laughs) Myrrh is the resin of the Kamifora tree. It can be found in Somalia and Ethiopia. So we're talking East Africa. It has similar qualities to incense. One distinction. 
Incense has a sweet fragrance. Myrrh has a bitter one. It was often burned after someone died because you don't want sweet smell and the smell of a body decaying together. Those are not good smells together. It takes a bitter scent to kind of counteract that smell. Myrrh has a lot of benefits for the human body, indigestion, ulcer, colds, cough, asthma, syphilis. Uh, when mixed with wine, it's an anesthetic. Remember when Jesus was dying on the cross later in Matthew, Matthew points out that they gave him wine mixed with myrrh. That's to dull the pain. Jesus refuses it. He's not going to go drugged into his death. Now, these three gifts are very expensive. It might surprise you to learn that myrrh was five times more valuable than gold, weight for weight. But like I say, the most common use was for embalming. Uh, there's a website called How It's Made. It's a fun show. They even have it on TLC or something like that. But they have an article about myrrh, and they said this. According to the Greek writer Herodotus, the Egyptians used myrrh in preparation of human mummies, a practice that predated Jesus' birth by thousands of years. You might remember when Jesus dies, Joseph of Arimathea brings 100 pounds of myrrh to pack with the body. It was just common. It was, it was a part of burial. Here's a knot. Anybody recognize what this knot is? That's a photo from 1922. That's the, the, the actual knot that sealed uh, Tutankhamun's tomb in the, in the Great Pyramid. When they broke that and they entered, when they broke that knot and the doors opened, they say the researchers were nearly bowled over by the smell of myrrh. It was so pungent in the air. So that they would give this gift is a foreshadowing of the suffering and death that this king would one day face. It would be the equivalent of bringing a quart of embalming fluid to a baby shower. It sends a message, doesn't it? it? But more importantly, it shows their understanding. If it's true that Daniel was over them and he wrote this book and they had remnants of that book and they understood what he wrote in chapter 9, they knew this was not just an ordinary king. This is a king who is born to die. And remember, they came to this conclusion and saw no miracles. They heard none of the profound teaching of the adult Jesus. They saw no external signs that he was the unique son of God. The only thing they have is the remnant of memory of being taught one time in their lives, a star in the sky and a helpless and weak child. But they see this vulnerable child and they believe they found a king, so they bowed and worshipped him. What an indictment on the religious leaders of the day. Do you know how far Bethlehem is from Jerusalem? If you've ever driven it, if you've ever been there, it's not far. It's six miles. That's the distance from this building to Medical City down on Forest Lane. The chief priests, the elders, the scribes didn't think it was worth a six-mile trip to check this out for themselves. They've got what God's word has said. They know where he's to be born. These visitors from outside have made a 700-mile trek based on what little bit of evidence they have. They don't even have the final piece of knowing the actual city, but they come anyway. They get it. Where are the chief priests and the scribes? I'll tell you where they are. They're in Herod's court, and they're trying to curry favor with a man who's going to be dead really soon. And the king of kings, the king of the universe is born. Six miles from them, and they don't have the wherewithal to check it out. They hold in their keys, in their hands, the key, and they won't even put it in lock. So these mystics from a faraway land with a broken spiritual system are living up to what truth they have, and they find the king of kings. Think about all the barriers they had to cross. A cultural barrier, a distance barrier, a language barrier, a racial barrier, a religious ba barrier. And not only that, they have to overcome a hostile king and indifferent religious leaders. What I'm saying is it wasn't easy for them to find Jesus, but they did. Because you know what? God always is a rewarder of people who seek him. And if you seek him, you'll find him. That's the promise of Scripture. If you live up to the light you've been given, he'll give you more light. When we close our eyes to the light, when we turn our hearts on the light, then the light is taken away. You know, sometimes I have friends, and I've had friends for many, many years, who still really do not get what Christmas is all about. They don't understand that this is just not the celebration of a baby born in a manger, that this is God of the universe coming into our world to live among us, to take our pain, to live our life, and to give his life for us so that we might live forever. They don't get that part. And yet this story always gives me hope. It gives me hope because it makes me realize God can use anyone or anything. He can use a star. 
He can use a book. He can use a song. He can use an off-the-cuff comment. He can use a paranoid king. He can use indifferent religious leaders. It doesn't matter. The God of the universe is looking for people who are looking for him. And if you're looking for him today, you do not have to leave here without him. It doesn't matter that you don't understand it all. The wise men didn't understand it all. They couldn't put it all together. They didn't have all the pieces. But they went in the direction that God pointed them, and they were rewarded by finding the object of their desires and falling on their knees to worship him. If you want him, you can have him. He's there for you. His heart is open for you. And anybody who sincerely desires him will never be disappointed. If you will, bow with me and let's pray together. Father, I am so thankful that for whatever reason, you want us. You love us. And Lord, when, when any of us, even with the weakest and most fragile of faith, turns in your direction, sincerely desires to know you at the center of their life, God, you are a rewarder of those who will seek you. And so God, I pray that in this room, the Christmas miracle will take for someone. Someone who doesn't know you yet. Someone who for whatever reason, maybe because of their pain, maybe because of hurt, maybe because of what some spiritual leader did to them at some point, maybe their heart has been closed, but God, it's not closed off to you. It is open to you, and there's a part of them that sincerely desires, that hungers to know you in a personal relationship. God, reward that desire today. Help them to follow their heart to the stable, to the manger, to the place where Jesus is, and to find him there, and to find their hope, and to find their reason, and to find their forgiveness, and to find their life. And for all of us, Lord, who many years ago took a knee before you and said, we have found the object of our desire. God, I pray that this Christmas will be a time of remembering and great gratitude for your wonderful gift to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas to you all.